to the Power of Us podcast. My name is Azure Gray and I'm your host. And we are taking a journey with leaders who have vision, take proactive action to make positive change in our community. Thank you so much for joining us, whether you are on your morning run, your commute, or just relaxing in the evening, if you get time to do that. I'm so glad that you've decided to join us and make time for the Power of Us podcast. Let's start the conversation because together, we are powerful. Today, I'd like to welcome the Amy Woodall. Good morning. Good to see you, Amy. Good morning. Good to see you too. Good to see you. Thank you for having me on. Absolutely. Thank you for for saying yes. So a little bit of official background about Amy. Amy is the visionary force behind Conscious Habit, which you can tell us a little bit more about. Also, no stranger to podcasts. You have a podcast by the very same name. And Amy is the co-founder of High Vibe Tribe Retreats for women around the world and is a certified meditation expert with thousands of hours under her belt. Did I get that right? And did I miss anything? You got it, sister. You are on top of it. (laughs) Okay. Good to see you. So we have known each other for a long time. I mean, it was probably 20 years since we were both about five years old, right? Yeah, right. I think five and a half, maybe, maybe yeah, if we're stretching yes. it a little bit. It has okay. been a long time. We really have come up in our in our careers together. Um, and so it's so cool to, to be here today to talk about what's up with me and, you know, chat through this venture with you, too. Absolutely. Thank you. I was thinking the same exact thing to have known you this long and, and seen the evolution of your career, your success and what you're up to now. So let's go ahead and, and dive in. Um, bravo to you. So as someone who knows you and others might not as well, let's start with a signature Amy Woodall quote. Own your shit. <laughs> Where did <laughs> own your shit come from? Tell me about the pivotal moment that, that really kind of created that catchphrase. Well, first of all, I have to say my Peloton handle is in an F-bomb, so it feels like very on brand. You know what I mean? Um, I think it was it was this journey of finding the root. So um, for a long time in my career, for about the first decade and a half, I worked for a performance improvement organization and we focused heavily on sales and going into organizations and being like, how do we teach you how to be more effective and efficient in sales by teaching you a process? And part of that process was teaching you a lot of psychological understanding as well and a lot of human behavior. And so doing that. Um, it was fun, but I could see that we were only creating top line growth for our clients and they would be coming to us saying, Hey, we've got this attrition because, you know, operations and customer service aren't living out these same things. And so we're, we're losing people. So me being like the, okay, I don't like a band aid. Let's go, let's go teach these things to customer service and to operations. So we did that. And I kind of laugh because I was so naive thinking that was going to solve it all, right? Well, we did start to see more holistic growth. That was helpful. But when I would go back and sit with executives, they would say, oh my gosh, I'm so overwhelmed dealing with these people problems because sales is always blaming, you know, operations and service for not getting the job done and services blaming sales for over promising. And so I'm like, okay, you know, not wanting to band aid, let's go fix this. And so I started teaching, um, you know, dealing with drama, conflict. I really became just a student even deeper of human behavior and managing conflict. And through doing that, what I began to find is that problems begin in the mind. They all begin with perception. Nothing is good or bad until we give it permission. And simultaneously, I was on my own journey of self-discovery and learning who the hell I was and how to navigate the craziness in my mind. And so I started teaching some of these concepts and own your shit became this, um, you know, sort of this radical, like, you know, kind of punch out there that says, hey, listen, you cannot control how they think, feel and respond about you. You can decide what you take of it. You can control how you choose to think, feel and respond. And if I am focusing on somebody else's part, I'm going to be stressed out and I'm going to be pissed and I'm going to have my hands tied. So radical ownership, own your 50 became the nicer way of saying own, own your shit. But that that really became my mantra. Yeah, absolutely. And I I love it. And sometimes I'm good at it. And other times I'll admit it is a struggle, but I guess I wouldn't be human if not. Right. Um, But but to be able to do it most of the time, it's good. 
or at least sometimes. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I think the deal, the it's never about yeah. perfection. And I know some of us, especially if you're a high achiever listening to this, we often put that kind of pressure on ourselves is like, if we're not doing it perfect all the time, then we suck. And the truth is we just got to be mindful. And I think even if you own it in hindsight, because one of the things and, and, you know, sort of in consciousness that I think about, and we'll get deeper into conscious habit is that as humans, we all have reactions. There are certain things that are going to push our buttons and we, and when that happens, we are like fight or flight. And there's these patterns that are going to emerge from us. Right. And the goal would be, how do we create a gap between reaction and response? Because Mm -hmm. that's when we can be more thoughtful, more conscious, and we are able to take more ownership in those moments as well. But if, Hey, you're human. If you don't do it in the moment, fine. Hey, I celebrate if we screw things up, but we are willing to take a look at it in the aftermath. Absolutely. And so let's imagine maybe that we have someone who doesn't do that. What kind of conversation Mm. do I have with them? Well, let's say it's in the context of work, right? Because many people listening to this are going to be, you know, professionals. I think the first thing is not weaponizing the ownership of, you know, that. I've had some conversations with teams who are like, oh, you know, they're telling me I need to own my part. And I say, hmm there's times where we can kind of weaponize that phrase and we need to be reflective before we have the conversation with someone else. And some of the things we can be reflective on for ourselves is why does this bother me? What judgment do I have about this person? What, what, you know, what, what might that reflect in myself? Because I'm a believer of if you spot it, you got it. If there is something that triggers an automatic judgment in me about you, it is because there's a part of me that I that I need to take a look at. So I think it's a reflection of self. Why does that bother me? Um, you know, what judgments do I have about this? And then even asking ourselves, like, who do I want to be? Who do I want to show up as? That allows us to be more thoughtful in our in that gap between reaction and response. For other people, I think the best thing that we can possibly do is get curious. And if we want somebody to take ownership, we might just start to ask the question of, you know, how do you think that that went? What would you, in reflection, what might you do differently? And people may deflect and say, you know, they go on Cartman's Drama Triangle, which is this place where you, you know, play victim, persecutor, or rescuer at any given time. They might want to play on Cartman's Drama Triangle. And I think we just encourage them to say, I hear you. And unfortunately, we cannot change how they think, feel, and respond. We might be able to influence it, but we can't change it. But what would you like to see within yourself? And I think through thoughtful questioning um, with a tone of both empathy, love, but also some directness that you're going to lead people to being able to take more ownership. Empathy, tone, and directness. I like that. Mm. And um, I'd say that usually the empathy and the directness, I get spot on. Um, The tone, sometimes that can be my challenge, that it lands in a way I did not actually intend. I've been there too. I mean, I think also like when we're hooked emotionally, if we, ha- if we are emotionally charged, <clears throat> we may be well-intentioned, but that will not always come through in our communication style. And I think advocate for that. I mean, one of my belief systems of being a good communicator is if you fear it, say it. And I think, you know, also in very like Amy style, I say, if there's an elephant in the room, you know, throw a saddle on that bitch and ride it around. Uh, and so I, I think the thing is, if you're fearful of of it, then say it. Just say, you know, as we're going into this conversation, I, I want to be mindful of my tone and there's times that it might go to a more critical state or annoyed state than I want it to. And if you're sensing that, I want you to call me out on it because I, that's not my intention. My intention is to show up with love and compassion for you. Absolutely. I think I've already got what I need for the day personally. So <laughs> let me see what else I can take you into for, for everyone else. Um, your mission is to empower others. Right. To take charge of their consciousness and lead happier, healthier and more enlightened lives. How do you do that? I mean, that's Mm. no small. That's no small feat. It's definitely not. It's not. And the work that we do at Conscious Habit is really teaching people how to navigate life from the inside out, you know, and it, it's inspired by my own journey and the work that I continue to do for myself for a long time. I looked at the world to please me and to give me feedback of whether or not I was successful or good enough or smart enough or I belonged in the room that I was in. And the thing that I found was when I put that responsibility on the world outside of me, it was a roller coaster ride. And sometimes 
sometimes I would feel good and sometimes I wouldn't. And I never really felt like I had control over what that looked like. The thing that I would then do in return was I would be on the chase and I would be on the chase for satisfaction and for fulfillment and to prove to other people I was good enough through achievement. And it, it got tiring. It really did. And then I started to see the same pattern in clients who would come to me, who would be people pleasers. They'd be perfectionists. They'd be these high achievers or they'd be, you know, somebody who longed for the approval of other people. And what I began to recognize is that when we're leading with these patterns, which are from the ego, I know ego can get a bad rap, but ego is like that voice in the head that convinces us we're not good enough and we've got stuff to prove. But when, when we're leading, you know, with that, it's always a chase. So in, in working with people who are dealing with the same thing, I'm like, there has to be a better way. And it really is learning how to live and lead from the inside out. And the relationship we have with ourselves, as soft as that might sound, the relationship we have with ourselves is equal to the relationship we have in the world. So life truly happens from the inside out, not the outside in. And when we take care of that, when we understand it, when we learn how to love the parts that feel unlovable, when we recognize we never had to prove anything, our worthiness has always been intact. When we, uh, you know, learn how to tap into our highest best selves and, and, you know, let ego step aside, we can be more fulfilled, more conscious conscious and learn how to love the hell out of it life you know from the from the inside out that's I have found that to be the root that I had always been searching for it's interesting you say the root and also I mean as you've mentioned we we've known each other for so long and have kind of been on some of this journey simultaneously shall we say even if they've been a little different um, familiar and, and similar in other ways one of the things I noticed for myself was um, two big challenges uh, one I, I think I'm still working on, but one of them was authenticity, right? Mm-hmm. And I actually had lunch with a former colleague from years ago, place I was when when you and I met, um, and he said, "This is the first time I feel I've actually seen your authentic self," which mm-hmm. was positive to me in some ways and negative in others. That I was thinking, "Who was I before?" Right? Mm-hmm. Or how was I was I showing up? That I had gotten that feedback more than once at that time in my life, and. The other is the ability to be vulnerable, which I'm still working on. And so as I think about it, that really probably has a lot to do with that change that this person saw in me. As, as you know, I've been through a lot the past few years. I, I lost my husband. I'm solo parenting now. Um, so thinking about that, that really created a, a big change for me. What was your catalyst that kind of got you to say, OK, I need to take a look at mine I need to make Mm -hmm. sure that that I show up as my authentic self, that I value myself. How did you what what brought you to that realization? I, you know, I think it was baby steps for me. And it's always so interesting to hear people's stories, right? Because sometimes there are abrupt changes that happen that are like, I am, I have no choice but to be a different human based on what I've experienced in life. And I think for me, it was a slower, you know, sort of self-discovery. And I just knew I didn't feel good in my own skin. And, you know, I didn't even, you know, that there was a lot of chaos and I wasn't very kind to myself at times. And um, I knew that I also, meditation, I'll tell you, that's where what started the journey for me. Meditation allowed me to create space between, you know, my thinking and my actions and the ability to have a deeper awareness over them. So that was That was one of my modalities that created this gap so I could sort of see things more clearly. Um, And it can be hard to see the picture when you're in the frame. So we do need people in our lives and we need, you know, some different modalities that can create a bit of attachment. So that was it for me. And then, you know, it's sort of this slow realization of like, this doesn't feel good. Ooh, I don't like this. And what's really missing and what's the story I'm telling myself. And I realized that I was more willing to be someone someone else wanted me to be, even if it meant abandoning myself. And and I didn't real I didn't know that on a conscious level, but right. once I understood that, it allowed me to really be curious about who am I, who am I like, and who can I be regardless of who's in front of me and not feel like I have to change who I am to please them, but by being myself more holy, they become more comfortable to be themselves. And so, I, that that was my slow and steady journey. And there's still times it's there. I think I just do integrity checks. You know, to say like, do I feel in alignment with integrity with myself? Do I feel like I'm really fully being me? Or was I trying to put on a face or a polish or something to make them think something may be true about me? 
Yeah, that's a that's a big one. And I know for me, it's been it was much more of a, a you know sharp left turn, tragedy hit, and and mm-hmm. it was simply you know buckle up and, and get it done. Mm-hmm. Um, for you, thinking about how you found it a little bit more slowly, if I'm a listener out there and I'm thinking, where do I begin? What would be the the first step you would you would offer or advise? I think it's just some deeper self-reflection of like, who do I believe I am? What do I believe is true about me? What are the pieces that I believe is true about me that I don't love or maybe I view negatively? What are the pieces that I believe are true about me that I feel are more positive? Who am I that may be different based on who I'm around? And I just want to say there is a difference between being flexible and meeting people where they are and changing who you are to meet them. That is, mm-hmm. it's a, it's a line, but it is a distinct difference in how we show up as authentic. And so I think some of that self-reflection, who am I? What's the positive stuff? What's the negative stuff? Um, who do I become? When, when do I become different? You know, and for, for what audiences, what parts of this feel best when I'm most aligned with them? Like, when do I really feel good and true? And I think it's just a mission of curiosity because sometimes we don't know. Sometimes we're, I, I have some folks that I'm coaching right now who have said, I don't know who I am or what I want because I've built an entire life based on what other people need and expect of me. And so baby step is curiosity. Yeah, I I absolutely agree. Um, I think one of the things that can help with that too is permission. I know um, when, when my late husband got sick and I needed to be everything to everyone and the day would be at minimum 16 hours and then get up and do it all over again. And I can't even convey how tough that was. So as I think Mm -hmm. about it, one of the things that was really helpful for me was a conversation I had with my father who gave me permission to take care of myself. Mm -hmm. You know, he Mm -hmm. he told me your kids will be okay. If you're okay, you have to stop and take the time to, and it's, it's, it's still a struggle just logistically speaking. Um, And then the mommy guilt and, and the um, need to wear the executive hat and switch on and off and all of those things. Um, But Thinking about permission, is that something that uh, you had to give yourself or it was just there? Yeah, I think it's grace along the way. And I think if we can realize that like this is the first time that we've done this human thing that we know of, <laughs> like, you know, and yeah. nobody really has it all figured out and there are always going to be bumps in the road and ups and down are normal as being a human, the emotions, the experiences, you know, that, but, but managing what we can internally, I think is helpful. So certainly permission goes along with that. <clears throat> I think being, you know, to add another level of curiosity is like, whose rules are you living by? Um, you know, what are the standards you expect of yourself and others? And it, it, it's likely if those are not working for you, it's keeping you trapped from who you really desire to be because you have these false expectations or these false rules that have been written on what good looks like or a good, what a good girl looks like. What a good, you know, especially for women, you know, we've kind of like, Oh, I need to make sure I'm perceived in the right way. Um, and yeah, look at the rules and if they're not working, rewrite them. I like that. I like that. It's one of the things I've always loved about you. So you mentioned this just now talking about roles. And so I want to kind of skip ahead and jump around a little bit on what I plan to ask you. As you think about looking ahead, what emerging trends do you think are going to be most significantly impactful for young professional women next five Mm -hmm. years? What do we need Mm -hmm. to, to be mindful of as we think about that? So I think we've we've done a lot of legwork on the mindfulness piece of how can I just be more mindful of what's happening in my mind and some of these practices. And I think what's coming up quickly is learning how to incorporate the spirit of the human that we are. And when we can get in touch with that, it really does allow us to be more authentic, you know, faster. So I think that integration of spirit into work is the next, you know, sort of trend or leg of where things are going, because if we look at the the you know patterns of burnout which a lot of people are experiencing and my my, my personal belief system is that by pro, or that burnout is a byproduct of us abandoning ourselves and it's abandoning that inner knowing that inner calling that 
this isn't for me. I'm doing this for someone else. I'm trying to run the political race in this organization or whatever. And we sacrifice our, you know, own joy and connection and really our own life for that. And so this connection of the the deeper spirit of who am I really and how can I live from that highest best self? I think that's a game changer. And if young professionals can start those practices early, they're going to be ahead of the curve. Yeah. The earlier that started, the the better. Figuring out mm-hmm. who you are um, is is definitely a, a big one. I know one of the one of the things that was always important to me as I was back in the 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 um, consulting world and, and thinking about helping people achieve more and reach their potential. One of the things that unlocked something for me, and and it was shared with me. It's not mine, but it's it's we judge ourselves by our positive intentions. We judge others by their actions. Mm-hmm. And so that's mm-hmm. what I meant to, that I meant well, you meant well, that's really all that matters rather than what's the result of that? How did it land? That's something that I always try to be mindful of successfully or not. But um, I found that to be a, a big one. Your thoughts on that? Yeah, I love that. It's fun. That's called fundamental attribution error, which is just rolls right off the tongue, doesn't it? (laughs) But it's true. And I think along with that, like getting connected, it sounds very woo, right? Oh, get connected to the spirit of you. But that means learning who the hell you are and what's right and what's wrong, learning how to trust your gut and knowing that the answers are always within you. And that that connection and that intuition and that knowing is freaking powerful. And it always also allows you to see the same kind of humanity and understanding for others. We can't give it to others if we don't have it for ourselves, at least not authentically and wholly. And so I think that, you know, what you're talking about is our ability to assume positive intent, to seek to understand rather than just to be understood, you know, to, to be a good communicator, a good collaborator. Um, I think a lot of that does stem from that that deep connection to self. And, you know, it's, it's funny you say that because one of the things I think is that often the um, conflict between career and family is, is mm-hmm. seen as opposed to how being uh, great in your career also helps you develop skills that are good for your personal life. And, and one of the mm-hmm. ways I noticed that was, was the, the time and attention I needed to give my children um, through and after this, this trauma in their life of, of their dad passing away. And so the ability to stop and give them that compassion has given me, I think, a better um, ability to have some for myself Maybe mm-hmm. also that that journey towards that authenticity of you can you can be where you are and um, simply be as honest as you can uh, about communicating that. Mm-hmm. I think that like children or pets or the things that we have unconditional love for, that's like, I might not always like you every second of every day, but I'm but never going to question. I'm, I'm never going to question whether or not I love you. Those can be our greatest teachers for learning how to really be somebody who gives unconditional love. And that's part of the conscious habit framework that we teach um, is how to incorporate love into our lives, both inside and outside. And it is, it, it is the hard stuff. And you know, being a love at work is not like we all love each other and we're one big family. No, love at work might be like, I need to call you on your shit because you're capable of more and I love you enough to have a tough conversation. So I, but I think that our great teachers can be those, those people or those things that we just naturally have unconditional love for. So what a, what a great example and experience your kiddos have given for you. An an upside uh, that I saw to to the down is that, you know, as a result, we will be stronger people. They will be stronger Mm. people. So you always have to look. Everything has some kind of of positive to it, and it can take a little bit to search for it. But once you find it, it it most definitely does help. So I'm going to ask you, um, there is something unique, I think, about your ability to blend professional and personal goals, growth, growth. What's the biggest challenge you've had personally or professionally in doing that yourself? Mm, I think it's uh, so many people can be very tactical, you know, where it's like, I have this problem, just tell me the techniques and tactics to do it. And I just want to stay very tactical. And so it is helping people to understand that 
you know, how you do anything is how you do everything. And if we don't dig deep and understand and start to rewrite the patterns and the tactical stuff is so temporary because you're going to have these same experiences over and over again, they might show up with a new name at a new, you know, location, you know, at a, a new job or something, but you're still going to bring all of these patterns to you. And I think, um, it's that for the people who are just like, this is nice, but just, t- just give me the tactical things on how to solve these problems. And I'm like, mm, we will, but not yet. <laughs> we, yeah. We've got to do some of the other work to solve the problem from the root, which it came before we get to that. What do you say to the non-believers? I know they exist out there who um, their mindset is that's mumbo jumbo. It's all about these tactical things. Just give me the list mm-hmm. and let me get it done and check it mm-hmm. off. What would you say to them? Well, I'd say you're right because you cannot convince anyone of anything that they are not willing to see. And I think for any of us, guess what? We've got to get tired of our own shit before we're willing to do to change. And so that sort of tactical thing can sometimes be a protection because people are like, I don't want to dig deeper. I don't want to look any deeper. No, thank you. It's very I, I'm happier living on the surface. And guess what? If that works for you, bravo. Bravo. But when and if it doesn't, when you're like, okay, there something's got to give. I'm not feeling good. I'm feeling overwhelmed. I'm not feeling connected. I'm not fulfilled. Whatever the case might be, then it's time to seek better, more longer lasting answers. And finding that fulfillment. So mm-hmm. I know um, both of us, executives, moms, different stages in our, our mom journey. But for you, how have you balanced your career, as well as your family. And of course, we, we even discuss the, the commute you make regularly during the week, right? <laughs> um, in order to, to conduct business and, and, and do your job. How, how, do you, how do you balance that? I think it's, um, I've been, I don't know if it's lucky or if it's intentional, right? Because I think there's a part of me that can say luck, but very intentional on certain sacrifices I'm unwilling to make. And I think, you know, I recently had a woman named um, um, Dr. Marie Helen Peltier on the podcast, um, and she talked about this resilience plan and she, and I loved her, her thoughts, but she's like, we're going to get burned out if we're not living aligned with our values. And my family and being there for my boys is a, really important value. And so it's not that I have never missed anything, but I've been very intentional about the yeses that I give because every yes creates a no somewhere. I mean, mm-hmm. there, you know, it, somewhere in life. And I've also, you know, it made it a non-negotiable in my career that I'm going to have a flexible work schedule and I will not be made to feel guilty. And by the way, I say that out loud because that was a message for myself of like, listen here, we're not making ourselves feel guilty, but also to the work environment to say, if I've got to leave because my kid has a class play, that's just going to be part of it and and if this is an environment that makes you know creates like well you you don't want it as bad then we're not a good fit for each other so boundaries you know holding true to those value systems and then it's coaching where I've had to tell myself many times um, guilt can be a gift thank you for the emotions can be a gift because you're showing me that I'm I, I have an opportunity to be more present and intentional somewhere and then guilt can also be a habit where we just think if I feel guilty then it means that I care more and so there's times where we have to take the gift and do something with it and then whatever is remaining we need to just say call BS and say guilt is not is not proof that I give a damn more um, if I feel this so we've also got to let it go yeah, learning to to use my guilt constructively is a, a little bit more of a, a new thing. Saying, you know, if I feel like I haven't been really focused on my work, um, haven't been uh, as good as a of, a of a coworker or team member as I could be, or I haven't been as as great of a mom, it, it, I try to take that as an opportunity to say, where am I being unrealistic and unreasonable mm-hmm. with myself, with my expectations? Mm-hmm. And where does it seem, you know what, it's time to work late or it's time to have an outing this weekend so that we have some quality time. And, and I think, as you mentioned, really just being curious, ha- having mm-hmm. a moment to, to stop and ask yourself that question. Meditation helps you to sometimes to get your mind quiet enough to find it. Mm-hmm. And presence. I think that's the piece is just like wherever you are, be there wherever Mm -hmm. you are, be there. Because I think more guilt shows up when maybe we are in the presence of our children, but we're we're feeling guilty for all the work that needs to be done. And so that's kind of what's on our mind. And we're not truly being present and in the moment with that. And energy speaks first. Mm 
And Mm -hmm. attention and intention is energy. It's an energetic connection that we make. And so I think for us to just hold ourselves accountable to what can I do to radically fight to be present to, you know, in this moment with them. Yeah. And, and sometimes, um, that can be, that can be a little tough when you're dealing with that. I really don't want to be present in this mess right now, Yeah, (laughs) but I got to deal with it, right? We all have those, those days. Um, so thinking about the impact that you have professionally, um, personally, and, and not even just personally with your family, but also personally in your interactions. I, I mean, I consider it, um, a, a, an actual gift to have known you as long and as well as I do. You've been a, a great friend, a great support system, um, and just somebody to kind of put me back, right? Kind of not give me that little gentle backhand back to where I, I need to be in thinking about some things. So how do you personally measure your impact as a leader? Hmm. I think it is alignment and authenticity and how much love did I give? Truly. I mean, I think there was a, a saying that I saw once that was, um, what if you only get to keep what, what if you only get to keep what you give away? And then I started to think about that. Like, what do I want to give? And, um, my mentor, I'm so grateful, Tim Roberts, really taught me this like power of love. And so I hope it's that. I hope that when I'm with people that they feel seen, that they feel understood. I think that's the greatest form of love is being seen and understood. I hope that um, they feel like they have a deeper belief in themselves, you know, that I've given them some borrowed belief. Um, and yeah, I hope that they have have just known that I showed up with truth. And I didn't BS them and, you know, there wasn't any, you know, sort of fake sentiment to try and get, get somewhere, get something that, that I showed up authentically aligned with me. Yeah. And, and you do, that's, that's one of the things I can personally say. And you mentioned, um, when thinking about, um, I think it was Mahatma Gandhi who said that, that man or people, our true goal is to be understood. It's, it's mm. I think, probably one of the things that's so challenging about being young, whether you're a child or kind of new in a workplace or feel a little bit like a thumb is to feel no one understands me. No, no one understands what it's like to be in, in sales because everybody's operations or, you know, I know I've dealt with with that in a few environments myself where you just don't feel understood. And what mm-hmm. what can that create for you if you don't feel understood? And, and how do you help? get there because you don't have control over others. Yeah. I, I, I always go with, I, it's sort of redundant, right? Start within. What do I need to know and understand about me? What compassion or love or acceptance do I need to provide to myself first? Because nobody's going to be able to give me the things that I don't give myself. I think it's also finding your, like, if you don't have it in the work environment that you're in, seek it out outside of there. Assemble a team of people who, you know, you know that you can learn from, that maybe can challenge you, that you can challenge them. And so, you know, create your posse, get, get, get out and meet some peeps, connect with folks on LinkedIn. And um, I think that being, you know, loneliness is real and we do need each other. We need yeah. each other. We need each other for reflection. It's hard to see the picture when you're in the frame, like I mentioned before. So I think that's a piece of it. And also seeking out mentorship. I mean, you know, I, you would if there is someone that you admire in the world and you feel like I could really learn from them or there's aspects of them I would I really desire to learn. You'd be surprised as how many yeses you'd get if you just ask the question. Yeah. So ask. ask. I, I agree with, with both of those thinking. I've, um, I like posse. I love your use of that. Personally, I, I refer to it as a tribe. Um, mm-hmm. But yes, I do. and I have a couple of them, right? A couple of different tribes that I know I go to for certain um, jokes we share, for challenges, um, advice, all of those kinds of things. And so you mentioned that Tim Roberts, wonderful human being, very smart man, has been a mentor to you. How have you approached mentorship as, as mentoring others? What does that look like for Amy? I think it can be quick conversations. I mean, I, I look at, you know, back to tribe, high vibe tribe retreats, Desiree Garcia and I started that because we wanted to create this environment where women felt like you, you can come here and no one expects you to be anything but you No no professional polish, no, like, what do you do for a living? But we're like bringing all of our real stuff. And so I, I think that there's, 
moments where there's some mentorship that happens and these incredible experiences that we have around the world with these women. Um, I think it could be in a one-on-one where somebody asks you to go to coffee and you just ask them questions that help them be reflective. I think that can be small acts of mentorship. Um, I think it can come in form of borrowed belief. So it doesn't always have to be this official, like someone asked me, we sit down, we spend an hour together every week or once a month or whatever. I think when we are in the presence of someone else, Else, how can we just help them help see them, understand them, and in turn help them understand themselves a little bit? Absolutely. If we've got maybe an, an experience or anecdote that, that we can share that might be um, applicable to them or at least something for them to um, try on like a sweater. That was always mm-hmm. a phrase, right, you know, to try feedback on like a sweater, see if it fits. Not necessarily everyone's perception of you or how they view the situation is going to match yours, but it's always really mm-hmm. good, I think, to take that that conversation and that feedback. And mentors are are great for that, I have to admit. One of mine is um, my father, of course, but that's that's a little obvious. Another is actually a friend of my mother's. They've been friends for about 70, 60 or 70 years since mm-hmm. you know they were teenagers. And so that woman has so much wisdom uh, professionally. Her path was was a lot more similar to mine than my own mother's. And so she's been one of those people who unofficially kind of um, came into my life in in that way. So I, I know exactly yeah. what you mean. I love that. And I think, in you know, with what you share, in order for us to give feedback, like we've got to create some kind of connection and, and some level of intimacy, mm-hmm. you know, because I have had people, I will never forget this man. Um, I spoke at a, we both spoke at the same conference. I don't know this guy, never met him in my life. And when the conference was over, he approached me and said, can I share some feedback with you? Because I care about you. And I thought, I don't know you. And the answer is, I'm not open for feedback at this time. Thank you very much. I would be open for feedback if I truly did know you. And I truly did know that you cared about me. But this feels a little ego driven. Like you, that you know, you feel a little intimidated. So you want to put me in my place. And so I think, you know, for anybody who is seeking out mentorship, or if you want to sort of share some of those mentoring moments that you have to earn the right first by creating some intimacy um, bef- before we get to try on the sweater of feedback, at least so that it's it, it has a chance of landing the way that you really want it to with love. I agree with you completely. I have definitely experienced both of those where I know, okay, that stung a little, but I needed to hear it. And mm-hmm. to usually go back later and say, by the way, I, I appreciate that you brought that to me. And then there's others where I have to admit, I'm thinking the audacity. Yes. <laughs> and it wasn't, I don't feel it was, it was driven by a desire to help me improve or to um, to really help me to grow as a person. Instead, it was, I want to tell you about yourself. And mm-hmm. that's usually driven by, as you mentioned, something within them that feels the need to check you. And it's, it's not really warranted because without that intimacy, it never lands in a positive way, really no, no matter who it is, right? Mm-hmm. Um, I mean, I, if, if my butt looks big in my jeans, I want to hear it. But not from that stranger. I'd much prefer you say, hey, you've got lettuce in your teeth, right? Thank you so much. I can't believe you would let me walk around like that. So yes. that's, I think, the the big difference. And if we're not comfortable enough to do that, you should probably keep some of that to yourself until we get there. Mm-hmm. Amen. Yes, most definitely. Well, we are um, getting close to our time. So one of the things I want to ask you is uh, our final question for all guests. So as you think about what lesson in your life, whether you learned it a long time ago or recently, is serving you best at this particular moment in your journey of of this one time around, you know, race that we get on this planet? What do you think? Oh, well... Um, for a long time, I, I've been like a personal development addict where I'm like, what's the next thing I need to learn? How can I get better? What's the next, you know, habit or understanding or even spiritual belief, right? I was sort of like, it felt very much like climbing a ladder to a level of understanding. And I had a pretty profound, um, you know, experience, a very spiritual experience that reminded me in an instant that I am whole and I have always been whole. And that has been the most profound experience because it no longer feels like a searching. It now just feels like a remembering. 
And that's a whole different level. There's not this pressure of like, oh, I got to get there. What's the next thing? I, you know, I got to be a better human before I leave this planet. Now I'm like, oh, right. I'm good. Yeah. <laughs> I'm trying to do it. Yeah. And, and everyone is. I think that's the thing is we are all whole and it is more, it's not a getting to, it's a remembering. And when we can come back to the remembering, everything builds from there and life becomes a lot more satisfying from there. Okay, I'm going to have to add one more final question then to find out how <laughs> did you get to that place? What advice would you would you leave with uh, with me with with the the viewers for how to to get to that state of, of enlightenment? Was there a, a specific um, life changing incident? Feel share what you feel comfortable sharing it, on that. It's so different for everybody, and I can tell you there's a lot of different paths. Sometimes it's through like really intense meditation. It could be the right types of retreats that you go to that allow you to get rid of some of the old stuff so you can get to that remembering. Um, there are meditations where people hit unity enlightenment where they're like, Oh my gosh, it all makes sense now, right? Everything's connected. For some people, it's the path of psychedelics. So maybe they go and do a you know ayahuasca ceremony or five MEO DMT. That's the path that some people choose for themselves. And some of it is just a slow learning where they finally get to the root of like, oh, aha. So there's not any one path. And I think some of the fun, we can make it fun, right? Often we make it treacherous and hard. And but life is a journey. We are being a student of ourselves. And if we just enjoy the ride and we're curious and we're open to new experiences that feel aligned for us, we will get there. I love that. Great note to end on. I am. Uh, I have already talked with a, one of my best friends about hitting the uh, high vibe retreat. Let, yes. let me just make sure I get that right. Is that the the high vibe tribe retreat? Okay, I want to make sure I, I get the name correct. So, looking forward to to joining you on one of those. Whether it's this year or next year, you can count on I will be there. We love. It. I love it. Welcome you with open arms. As always, thank you so much for for joining us, for taking the time today, um, and for all of the the viewers. I hope you've got something positive out of this, some things that you can apply to your own life. Um, and remember that together we are powerful. And so I'm Azure Gray, your host, signing off for the day. Thanks. Mm -hmm.